Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I welcome you all uh, to this second uh, clinical pathological conference of dermatology in JPMC Karachi. First conference was held by Professor Mehra Talat in Civil Hospital Karachi last month. And this is the second one. The aim of this conference is to present our good cases, good worked up cases to you all so that everyone gets benefited and get some experience in learning out uh, from uh, these cases. So first of all, I will just, uh, present some introduction of our institute, which is the Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Karachi. This is one of the largest tertiary care hospital of Karachi, of Pakistan, in fact. This is our ward, uh, top floor of the Sulti block, dermatology ward 10. Our department was founded by Professor Sahir Singh Harun in 1976, when he came back from England. Professor T. S. Harun left JPMC in 1989 to join New Hospital Lahore. Our ward is 40 bedded department, OPD twice a week with many facilities uh, available for uh, patients. Uh, our department was re recognized for training uh, in 2015 for MCPS, MCP, FCPS, MCPS, and MD. We currently we have 19 SCPS and 17 MCPS trainees. We have structured training program. We conducted various uh, workshops, seminars, and webinars uh, on various topics like acne and acne scar, EB awareness week, dermoscopy workshop, lep leprosy workshop, and also we uh, we hold the this 37 arranged 37 PADCON in Karachi in 2018. Our goal is to improve the quality of life of the patient with skin diseases and to promote skin health and research. This is our department of dermatology. Thank you. Now we will formally start our presentation. We have four presentations uh, today, four cases four, uh, presented by uh, each, presented by one of our uh, colleagues postgraduate training. First of all, I will invite Dr. Shilpa to come on the stage and present her case. Thank you. I am Dr. Shilpa, working as a postgraduate trainee in dermatology department, JPMC. So there was a patient, 44-year-old male, Mr. Bashir, married, smoker, 13 pack year, resident of Capital with no known comorbids, presented via urgent necrotic plaque over the right lateral aspect of the scalp, forehead, and right knee auricular region for two months. According to my patient, he was all right two months back. Then he had a trauma by a kicker plant over the right parietal region of the scalp. After coming back home, within first, he felt pain and itching over that area without any focal swelling. Itching was present all the day and within five days, he developed a painful necrotic plaque over the right side of his scalp and in a matter of one and a half months, it rapidly progressed to involve most of his scalp, forehead and right the auricular region. For that, he was admitted in Multan Hospital, multiple oral and IV treatments were given but with no effect. It was associated with pain, prolonged discharge, and ulcer. No any history of burning, itching, or any blood discharge. Patient also had a complaint of continuous current-like pain that was severe in intensity. No any aggravating factors, but relieved by injectable pain flares for a few hours. There was also history of prolonged discharge, which was scanty, yellowish in color, and not false swelling. There was no any history of fever, weight loss, night sweats, any other skin rash and lumps or bumps in the body. No history of diabetes or IV drug abusing or any surgery, pre-existing open wound, burns or any medication such as steroids. No history of headache, facial pain, nasal congestion, hyposnia or vision problem. There was no prior history of COVID infection before developing this region. On systemic review, Rest of uh, history was unremarkable. Past medical history, he was admitted in Multan Hospital for 15 days with SAM complaint. Past surgical history, not significant. Drug history, multiple antibiotics and painkillers taken, but patient doesn't remember the name and documents not available. Transfusion and allergic history is not significant. Personal history, normal, except there is an addiction of smoking. Family history, one brother has diabetes. Rest of the family members are healthy and alive 
and no any illness running in any family. Socioeconomic history is satisfactory. So now coming toward the examination of my patient of average height and built well oriented with time, place and person with vital blood pressure of 120 by 70 mm mercury with no partial drop. My patient was vitally stable, subvitals negative. On cutaneous examination, as you can see, there's a well-defined thick necrotic plug measuring about 15 and 16 centimeter in size involving the scalp extending from the right side of scalp, crossing the midline, forehead, and right pleural region. On further examination, there is tenderness and temperature gradient, adherent to underlying structures, and you can see the surrounding skin is regimetous. There is also an ulcer which is tender, undermined edges with irregular border present in the right pleural region, purulent discharge and yellowish crust overlying the ulcers, and regional lymph node not present. Rest of the body examination and all other systems were unremarkable. Now the case summary of my patient, 44-year-old male smoker presented with two months history of necrotic plug over the scalp, forehead, and right preauricular region after trauma. On examination, thick necrotic plug present with tenderness and temperature gradient. Surrounding skin is erythematous, regional lymph nodes not palpable, and no any history of fever, weight loss, or chronic illness. So on the basis of history and examination, two differentials came in mind that include cutaneous mucormycosis, aspergillosis, necrotizing fasciitis, and eczema gagnosum. All these differentials can present with necrotic plug, but like cutaneous mucormycosis initially manifest as cellulitis, and aspergillosis can start as papules and nodules, and necrotizing fasciitis and eczema gagnosum are usually acute condition, the patient may have short history and may be systemically ill. To confirm our diagnosis, we ran few investigations. Here are the results. Complete blood count, hemoglobin at the time of admission, 11 gram per deciliter. PLC count, 13.2. Blood sugar levels, 130 mg per deciliter. And rest of the electrolytes, liver function test, and coagulation profile normal. Chest X-ray, unremarkable. Viral markers, including HIV crawls, negative. HVA1C 5.2% and pus culture shows clapsilla pneumonia, COVID PCR negative, and skin scraping fungal element C. Now, the histopathology slide of our patient, as you can see, there are the aseptate hyphae C, the broad aseptate hyphae in the histopathology slide. And other taste that is lactophenol cotton blue staining, you can see the picture. Again, there are broad accepted hyphae seen with extension of columella into the sporangium. So the mucor was seen on the basis of this accepted hyphae. Tissue culture shows the heavy growth of enterobacter species. CT scan was done and that shows subcutaneous soft tissue thickening. MRI shows the similar findings. On the basis of investigations, our final diagnosis came out to be cutaneous mucormycosis. So let's see the, how the patient was managed. You can see in the picture, the surgical debridement of grossly necrotic tissue was done at the earliest possible time. This is the picture just after debridement. And then m was started at the one mg per kg per day dose with urea creatinine electrolytes monitor. You can see the pictures. Now the debrided wound is monitored for the resolution of rhythm and induration before definitive deconstruction. Again, so the topic discussion. Mucormycosis is a disease caused by infection with fungus belonging to mucorils. The most causative organisms include rhizopus and mucor. Rest include rhizomucor and lysipenia. Types of mucormycosis, rhinocerebral, pulmonary, cutaneous, gastrointestinal, and disseminative. If our patient was diagnosed with cutaneous mucormycosis, so I'll talk about it. There are two types, primary and secondary. Primary that occur due to direct implantation and secondary via hematogenous dissemination. Risk factors include immunosuppression, diabetes, malignancy, and so on. Trauma and the contaminated wooden sprints were the risk factor in our patient. These all are the risk factors. Clinical presentation. Disease may manifest as cellulitis that can progress to dermal necrosis and black spot formation. This is the picture uh, that shows cutaneous mucormycosis at the IV site. Rare cases also have been uh, seen at the catheter and insulin site. Investigation. 
Let you care the histopathology and political culture. I already mentioned histopathology shows the non-septate hierarchy and culture is generally required to determine the species of influence. Treatment. The two main classes of antifungal medications used to treat mucormycosis are polines that include amphotericin and triazoles that include isoconazole and cosaconazole. Polines, how they act? They bind irreversibly to ergosterol resulting in the disruption of membrane integrity, allow the leakage of intracellular components, ions, and that ultimately lead to cell death. There are few side effects that we should keep in mind before starting amphotericin, such as pain and burning at the injection site, muscle cramps, nephrotoxicity, electrolyte imbalances, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, and leukocytosis. Triazoles, that inhibit ergosterol synthesis by blocking the enzyme alpha demethylase, which convert lenoestrol to ergosterol. Prognosis and survival depend on the early diagnosis and timely initiation of treatment. Motility depends on the site of infection as rhinocerebral form is highest motility rate, and despite the advances in treatment, motility varies between 40 to 80 percent. The incidence of COVID-19 mucormycosis also has been increased in few case reports, especially rhinocerebral form. At last, there are just few case reports available uh, that show the primary cutaneous mucormycosis. There was a one case report that shows the primary cutaneous mucormycosis occurred following a road traffic accident. Thank you. Now, ma'am, Ravi, I'll further discuss about this. Uh, so, so uh, very nice case, Dr. Shilpa. Nice presentation. So, this is another case uh, of cutaneous mucormycosis. Um, uh, we very rarely from, uh, we get it very rarely in our setup. We often get the rhinocerebral mucormycosis in diabetic patients in our medical wards or in nephrology wards or ICUs. But this cutaneous, uh, primary cutaneous mucormycosis is uh, the almost the first case uh, I have seen in my um, um, uh, practice. Uh, and it was after the trauma inoculation trauma uh, by a thicker plant. Uh, after um, on the scale, so uh, and it was uh, diagnosis was delayed for two months. Because he was uh, going here and there without any uh, improvement, and uh, so we did the histopathology and started amphotericin B following the debridement. So amphotericin, when we gave the amphotericin B to this patient, um, you know it's a toxic drug and we have to give it very carefully. Fortunately, until now five grams have been given and uh, his uh, wound is much improved. He had some minor side effects like diarrhea and hypokalemia, but over, once his creatinine raised to 1.5 or 2, but it came down. Uh, so uh, still now we are successfully treating. And when this patient arrived, uh, we had negatively counseled the, uh, him because the, uh, he, the mucormycosis was already reaching uh, to the facial pain and to, up to the forehead and near the eyes. So, uh, and initially, um, so, uh, uh, so prognosis was very guarded, but fortunately, uh, with timely management, uh, this patient has survived and is doing very good. And now, 80 percent, more than 80 percent, uh, vision is healed. And we will follow it with the secondary uh, reconstruction after we get rid of mucormycosis. But it is very, very resistant infection because after initial dose completion, we when we stop amphotericin B after two days. Maybe he again developed some edema and swelling of the, so we started again. Uh, so uh, still we have given the five grams of empathetic B. So next case will be presented by Dr. Alman. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity again. I'll quickly review my case. My name is Dr. Alman, and the case I'm going to present is about a 60-year-old female Taj baby, married, housewife from Palat, Balochistan, known diabetic and hypertensive, and came to us through OPD with a complaint of painless swelling over her scalp since three months. According to my patient, she was all right three months back when she noticed some pea-sized red swelling over the center of the scalp by combing her hair. It was painless, not associated with any other symptom, but in the period of three months, the swelling increased in size involving the front of the scalp extending to forehead. She had only mild burning sensation over it and she also noticed loss of hair. No similar morphology swelling was present on any other part of the body. There was no history of pain, fever, malaise, cough, or dyspnea. She gave history of weight loss, which was not documented. She gave history of trauma at the same site six months before the swelling appeared. 
Moving towards the systemic review, it was unremarkable. Her past medical, as already discussed, she was diabetic since 20 years and hypertensive since 15 years. No history of hepatitis, TB, or any other disease. Past surgical was not significant. Drug history, she's taking metformin 500 mg for diabetes and NOAS 10 mg for hypertension. Allergic history and transfusion history was not significant. In personal history, appetite, sleep, micturation, bowel habits were all normal, and she was not an addict. Her family history had no any similar morphology or any other chronic illness, and socioeconomic history was satisfactory. On examination, an old female of average height, normal build, sitting comfortably and well-oriented with time, pace, and person, with vitals at the time of presentation were pulse 88, BP 130 by 90, respiratory rate 21 breaths, and she was not febrile. Her subvitals were unremarkable except that her bilateral lymph nodes were palpable in the posterior auricular and occipital area of about 1.5 centimeter diameter, firm, non-tender, mobile, and discreet. On cutaneous examination, as you can see in this picture, there is a gross violaceous tumoral swelling starting from the vertex and extending towards the forehead and temporal area. There was also an erythematous plaque of about three by four centimeter over left temporal area. It was not tender, no temperature gradient, firm in consistency. The surface was smooth, no oozing or crusting notice, not attached to the underlying bone. A three by four centimeter crusted erosion was also present over the swelling. The overlying hair were sparse. Rest of cutaneous involvement was unremarkable. Nail and mucous membrane examination was also unremarkable. These are some of her other pictures from different views. Some more. Here you can see the lymph nodes. Her systemic examination, including the abdomen, respiratory, cardiovascular, CNS, were all unremarkable. So on the basis of history and examination, we came to some differentials. After the case summary, I'll be presenting you the differential. Her case summary is a 60-year-old lady presented with three-month history of bra swelling over her scalp. History of weight loss. On examination, there are erythematous to violaceous tumoral swelling starting from the vertex of the scalp, extending towards the forehead and temporal area, not mm -hmm. adherent to underlying bone, no oozing or crusting notice. Posterior auricular and occipital lymph nodes were palpable, no any other remarkable finding. The differentials include our top differential on this basis were cutaneous angiosarcoma, B cell lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, and cutaneous max. We ran different investigations. Her hematological liver function tests, electrolytes, PT, viral markers were all insignificant. But her hemoglobin A1C was significantly raised with 10% poor diabetic control. We performed biopsy, which showed in deep reticular dermis, there is an atypical vascular proliferation comprising of anastomosing vessels, which are lined by single focally multilayered endothelial cells. They have cytological atypia with nuclear enlargement and pleomorphism. Her immune histochemical stains were also done, which showed ERG positive, which is an endothelial cell marker. A skin biopsy for histopathology, here you can see irregularly branch vessels within the tumor. The tumor cells showed mitotic figures. Here you can see ERG, which is an endothelial mar uh, cell marker. The tumor cells has taken it. So our final diagnosis, on the basis of biopsy and cutaneous examination was cutaneous angiosarcoma. To look for the spread, we went through multiple other investigation. We got through ultrasound whole abdomen, which was otherwise unremarkable, just showing polylithiasis. Her echo was normal. CT brain showed multiple extra calvarial soft tissue nodules in bilateral frontal, right hyperital, and left auricular region, producing focal skin bulge, no calcification or intracranial extension noticed. The PET scan showed hypermetabolic cervical and intraparotid lymphadenopathy with pulmonary and skeletal max. So on these bases, we diagnose it as cutaneous angiosarcoma with pulmonary lymphadenopathy and skeletal metastasis. Treatment, we took on board oncologists and plastic surgeons. After counseling the patient for the poor prognosis, we just decided to go for palliative treatment. Surgery was not done. And as she came from Koita, she wanted to return back and we discharged her own request, keeping a follow-up. 
Two months later, she sent me this picture showing a gross ulceration over the swelling. So for this ulceration, she went to an oncologist in Quetta and she gave her tablet Levic, which is an imitinib misylate, and it helps to stop the cell proliferation, cancerous cell proliferation. But it does not have direct role in endosarcoma. And oral antibiotic, topical antiseptics, but unfortunately, a patient could not survive, and after one year of diagnosis, she expired in July 2021. A brief review of angiosarcoma. What is an angiosarcoma? It is an uncommon malignant neoplasm characterized by rapidly proliferating, extensively infiltrating anaplastic cells derived from blood vessels and lining irregular blood spaces. It is very aggressive, reoccur locally, high rate of metastasis towards the lymph node and systemic metastasis. The rate of tumor-related death is very high. Risk factors include radical mastectomy, radiotherapy, foreign material, which could be a risk factor in our patient too, environmental carcinogens, AIDS, and genetic disorders. Now, the most common type of angiosarcoma is angiosarcoma of scalp and face. It involves head and neck and usually occurs in the elderly patient, also known as Wilson-Jones angiosarcoma or senile angiosarcoma. The clinical pattern is usually nodular, diffuse, or ulcerated. Treatment is according to low risk, which does not metastasize, and high risk, which is metastatic. So for low risk, we go for surgical excision with or without radiotherapy, and for high risk, we go for radiotherapy with chemotherapy. And chemotherapy, there are two options, doxyribicin and paclitaxel. Nowadays, we can directly go for paclitaxel as a first-time therapy. This was all from my side. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Faizal Naam and I am a postgraduate trainee in the Department of Dermatology, JPMC Karachi. And today we have to discuss a case of a five years old male patient with no known co-mobs, resident of Baldia town, security guard by the profession. And he was a female addicted for the last 25 years and smokers, 15 packs per year, presented via OPD with the complaints of Multiple ulcers presented over the face, bilateral upper limb, tongue, and back for the last six months. According to my patient, he was in usual state of health six months back when he developed undocumented high-grade intermittent fever, which was not associated with rigors and chills. Sometimes it was relieved by taking antipyretics, and it was not associated with cough, sore throat, ear pain, or burning inflammation. For his fever, he went to some nearby doctor and received some intramuscular injection over his left upper arm. After one week, he noticed erythematous, painless, P-sized swelling over the injection site, which progressively increased over a period of one month. It was then ruptured with the prurent discharge, leaving behind a non-healing painless ulcer, which increased in a size over the period of three months. These ulcers then increase in number to involve his left eyebrow, left cheek, then the whole face, back, upper limb, and chest in a similar course. It was associated with the generalized body age, which was mild to moderate in intensity, not specific with any time, and there is no family history of it. There is no history of any night sweats, lumps and bumps, erythroderma, or bleeding from any side, nasal discharge, or the conics and exposure. Rest of the systemic uh, review was unremarkable. His past medical and surgical history was also unremarkable. On the personal history, as we previously discussed, he was a few addicted for the last 25 years and a smoker. He was giving the history of decreased appetite and undocumented weight loss for the last six months. Rest of the transmission, occupational, allergic, and terminal history was unremarkable. His family history was also unremarkable, and there is no similar complaint or skin disease in the family. He belongs to the low socioeconomic status. Now coming towards the examination, we have a middle-aged male of average height and build, well cooperative and widely stable throughout the examination. His subvitals are also normal. On the cutaneous examination, we can appreciate multiple ulcerated plaques presented over the face, upper limbs, trunk, and on the back. As in, as in this picture, we can appreciate multiple ulcerated plaques over the face. Largest one is on the left arm, as we see in this picture, uh, which is about 6 by 5 cm in size, necrotic, indurated, along with the hemorrhagic uh, crust with the pulling discharge, with well-defined raised margins. There was, uh, it was non-tender, no temperature gradient, and it was not adherent to any underlying structure. 
Uh, in this picture, we can appreciate multiple ulcerative plaques and some hypopigmented patches with the pollen discharge along the anterior aspect of the chest. These are the some, uh, we can also appreciate some multiple discrete, well circumscribed hypopigmented patches presented symmetrically over the bilateral upper and lower limbs, trunk and back, with no hair loss, sweating, and sensations were intact. In this picture, we can appreciate these multiple hypopigmented patches over the back of the patient. These are some more pictures of the same patient showing these hypopigmented patches over the back. Uh, these are the pictures, uh, some more pictures which shows the bilateral uh, presence of the hy bilateral hypopigmented patches over the upper limbs and the lower limbs. We can also appreciate some small erythematous to skin color nodules over the forehead, nose, and the lower lip with overlying hemorrhagic resting, while palm, sole, the scalp, mucosa, and genitalia were skin. As in this, in this picture, we can appreciate these small nodules. Rest of the systemic examination were unremarkable. Now, to summarize my case, we have a 45 years old male patient, addicted and a smoker, presented via OPB with the complaints of multiple nodules, ulcerated plaques, along with the hypopigmented patches presented over the face, trunk, bilateral upper and lower limbs for the six months, along with the history of undocumented weight loss and fever, and mild to moderate itching was also due. So, on the basis of the history and clinical examination, uh, we put our uh, we did, now we discuss uh, on the basis of history and clinical examination. Now we discuss our differential diagnosis. So we divide our di uh, differential diagnosis on the basis of the hypopigmented patches along with the ulcerated plaques. Uh, as the as our patient is male and there is a prolonged history of these hypopigmented patches along with the ulcerated plaques, we kept mycosis fungal disease as our first differential. We kept leprosy in our second differential as it was also presented in the form of these hypopigmented patches, but again, ulcer was not failing it. Uh, hypopigmented sargidosis is also presented as these hypopigmented patches, so we also kept in our differential diagnosis. On the basis of these ulcerated plaques and the prior history of the trauma, we also kept deep mycosis infection in our differentials. Uh, we also put cleva along with the T cell lymphoma in our diagnosis, along with the cutaneous mats, which is secondary to the leukemia cutis as well, because these are also presented in the form of these ulcerated nodules, plaques, or these papillonecrotic regions. So, for the confirmation of the diagnosis, uh, we proceed with the skin biopsy for the histopathology after some baseline routine investigations, which were quite normal. It's now we discuss the skin biopsy. We took two samples. Sample one was taken from the uh, left arm over the uh, over the necrotic plaque, and this slide basically shows the hyperkeratosis, ethanthosis, and the elongation of the retinal edges, along with the interepidermal collection of the atypical lymphocytes known as the quartier microabscesses and the epidermal, and it also shows the epidermal processes. While there is a dense infiltrate of the atypical lymphocytes and the histocytes in the dermal layer. So these are the elongated ridges. This shows the portrait microabscesses, and this is shows the deep dermal infiltrate. This is the magnified image which shows the atypical lymphocytes having irregular surface and the cerebroform nucleus. Some normal lymphocytes can also be shared in this image. Sample 2 taken from the rhythmatous nodule over the right upper arm and it also shows the intraepidermal collection of atypical lymphocytes known as the portia microabscesses and the dense dermal infiltrate. Immunohistochemistry chemistry is positive for the CD4 cells and the CD8 cells. And, K and CD4 to CD8 ratio was increased, and KI67, which is a microproliferation, is also increased, and CD30 was less. So, our uh, findings or our results are consistent with the mycosis from IDs, nodule stage, and the plaque stage. These are the routine baseline investigations, which include the CDC, peripheral film, LFTs, uh, UCs, and coagulation profile, and DR, which are quite normal. 
the uh, viral serology for hep b hep c and hiv were also on your markable we also advise ultrasound abdomen pelvis and chest x ray which were quite normal this ldh level is slightly high that is the 500 we also perform slit skin smear for the mycobacterium lepti which was negative tissue culture for the fungal smear and acid fast bacilli was also unremarked for the staging prognosis and treatment purpose we advise ct scan chest abdomen and pelvis which was unremarkable pet scan was also done which shows the non white subcutaneous nodules which are scattered all over in its body and there is a hypermetabolic subcutaneous nodule seen at the posterior chest wall at the level of the b6 patella so on the basis of clinical histopathologic traces our final diagnosis is the mycosis fungal disease stage 2b basically stage 2b include the cutaneous tumor with or without the involvement of palpable lymph nodes and the visceral mats but in our patient uh, there is no palpable lymph node was appreciated these are some treatment guidelines for the stage 2b we can uh, consider skin direct therapy but alone it was not sufficient so we can also move toward the systemic therapy we can give puva along with the interferon alpha and the baroxetin and total skin electron beam therapy is also in our option uh unfortunately our patient is lost to follow up and he again presented to us on 2nd of february 2022 with the exacerbation of the disease and these are is some recent pictures with the extension of the disease we can appreciate these multiple ulcerated plaques multiple ulcerated plaques along with these hypopigmented patches presented over all over his body thank you i would like welcome to dr nazir sir for further this discussion Assalamualaikum. My name is Dr. Nazia, and I am FCPS two trainee at Department of Dermatology, JPMC, Karachi. Today, I am here to present the fourth case of the CPC uh, of Mr. Wahid, thirty-five-year-old married male, resident of Larkana, shopkeeper by profession, came to us via OPD with the complaints of hypopigmented lesions on the body since five years, and erythematous scaly lesion on the arm and legs since four years. so according to my patient he was in ul state of health 5 years back then he noticed a small hypopigmented lesion adjacent to the right axilla that gradually and progressively increased in size and numbers over the period of one year to involve face bilateral upper extremity back leg groin and buttocks along with that he also developed a erythematous scaly lesion adjacent to the axilla and over the lower limb these were associated with mild itching burning sensation loss of fear and sweating patient denied any history of fever cough malaise night sweat weight loss joint pain lumps or bumps these lesion were persistent throughout and he denied any history of aggravating or relieving factors for these complaints he went to multiple doctors and was prescribed with multiple topical medicines but no record available then patient went to leprosy center larkana and there his anti leprosy treatment was started which he took for 2 years with no any improvement his systemic review was totally unremarkable his past uh, medical history except for the uh, running illness otherwise unremarkable his past surgical history not significant a uh, personal history except the decreased appetite otherwise unremarkable his father died of cardiac arrest in 2007 and mother is hypertensive otherwise family history uh, all the family members are healthy and alive no similar complaint or skin disease running in the family drug history is important here he took multi basic uh, regimen of anti leprosy drugs for 2 years along and before that he also used multiple topical medicines prescribed on and off but there was no any history of taking any new medications or any other oral or iv medication his socio economic history was satisfactory now moving towards the examination my patient was uh, a young male of average height was cooperative and with the white normal vitals and sub vitals on cutaneous examination there were multiple discrete well circumscribed 
hypopigmented patches with ill-defined borders and few scaly erythematous plaques with surrounded hypopigmented halo. These patches and plaques were associated with loss of hair and sweating, but their sensation were intact. These were distributed over the face, neck, trunk, limb, buttock, groin, with the sparing of palm, sole, scalp, and mucosa. As you can see in the pictures, there are multiple hypopigmented patches distributed over the trunk, also on the arms. There are also few poikilodermatous patches on the bilateral arms. There were also few uh, erythematous scaly plaques on the bilateral lower limbs with the surrounded hypopigmented halo. His CNS abdominal examination, respiratory, CVS, musculoskeletal examination was unremarkable. Now to summarize my case, my patient was 35-year-old male with a five-year history of multiple itchy, hypopigmented, and few erythematous lesions gradually progressive, distributed over the whole body, associated with the loss of sweating and hair, with no any history of fever, night sweat, and weight loss. For these complaints, he took anti-leprosy treatment for two years. On examination, multiple hair loss, hairless, and hydrated, hypopigmented patches, and few erythematous plaques of variable sizes distributed over the whole body, with the sparing of palm, soles, scalp, and mucosa. Rest of the examination was unremarkable. So now on the basis of uh, history and clinical examination, our first differential was hypopigmented MS. As patient has a chronic history of itchy, hypopigmented and erythematous plaques and patches in a bathing suit distribution, and patient is of young age. Uh, our second differential was cutaneous sarcoidosis, it is important to consider cutaneous sarcoidosis in a hypopigmented patches of a long history. Our third differential was leprosy, considering the hypopigmented patches with the loss of hair and sensation, loss of hair and uh, sweating, but sense, intact sensation. And uh, he took uh, multi leprosy treatment, multi abridgment of leprosy for two years without any improvement. To confirm our diagnosis, we uh, perform skin biopsy for histopathology and immunophenotyping after running few routine investigation, which were normal. A skin biopsy, so uh, as you can see, shows starting from the epidermis, hypokeratosis, uh, mild orthokeratosis with mild spongiosis. There are uh, atypical lymphocytes tagging the dermoepidermal junction. And also a uh, nest of lymphocytes, which are uh, atypical lymphocytes in the epidermis, which are known as potrier microabscesses. There are also atypical lymphocytes surrounding the vascular and perifollicular structures. In the 100x power, you can appreciate there are atypical lymphocyte infiltrate with the cerebriform nuclei and prominent nucleoli. Immunohistochemistry shows CD3 positive, CD8 positive with a reverse CD8 to CD4 CD4 to CD8 ratio. The CD8 was also positive with the predominant population. So on the basis of histopathological findings, our diagnosis was hypopigmented mycosis fungoides. As I have already mentioned, his routine investigations like complete blood count was totally normal, with the peri but the peripheral film shows an isocytosis and few occasional nucleated RBCs, but no atypical lymphocytes seen. His LFTs, renal profile, population profile, urine DR were unremarkable. His viral markers, including HIV serology, were negative. Ultrasound abdomen, chest X-ray was unremarkable. His LDH was within normal limit. Flick skin smear for Mycobacterium leprae was also performed, which was negative. For the staging purposes, CT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis was performed, which was unremarkable. 
His PET scan was also performed, which showed generalized increased uptake in the muscle of axial and appendicular structure. Otherwise, no abnormal uptake seen. So, on the basis of clinical finding, examination, and histopathological finding with the CT scan and PET, our final diagnosis is hypopigmented mycosis fungoides, patch plug stage 1B, which include uh, generalized patches and plug greater than 10% surface area involved with no any clinically and pathologically pathological involvement of lymph nodes and no any visceral metastasis. So on the basis of uh, staging, our treatment plan will be skin-directed therapies, which I will uh, further evaluate in subsequent slides. There was a similar case report, which, are, which was reported in Indonesia in 2021, with a patient having hyperpigmented patches, mistakenly being treated as leprosy, with no improvement. Later, he was diagnosed as hypopigmented mycosis fungoides and was, was started on systemic and topical steroid with the dramatic response in the matter of six months. So here is important, one important point. If a patient come, can come to us with a long history of hypopigmented patches, we should consider hypopigmented mycosis fungoides other, along with other differential lines. Now, a few words about mycosis fungoides. Mycosis fungoides is a commonest type of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. It has three stages, patch, patch plaque, and tumor. There are multiple variants like follicular tropic, follicular derma, derma hypopigmented, capillaritis, calciform bullets. Now emphasizing the hypopigmented mycosis fungoides, it is an atypical, rare, unique variant of mycosis fungoides, which usually present in a younger age than the classical MF with solely hypopigmented patches or in combination with erythematous patches or plaques. These patches and plaques are really itchy, but local sensitivity is always preserved. Their distribution is really in the bathing suit distribution like the classical MF. Most patients with the hypopigmented mycosis fungoides are misdiagnosed as having other hypopigmented skin disorder, most commonly as leprosy. For the diagnosis purpose of mycosis fungoides, we require histopathology, immunophenotyping, PCR gene analysis, and the molecular studies. There is one important point in immunophenotyping of hypopigmented ML that it has a CD8 positive T cell phenotype predominant P, in contrast to the conventional ML, as it as for the case in our patient. Treatment of mycosis fungoides is divided into two. Uh, uh, therapies, two types of therapies, skin-directed and systemic. On the basis of prognostic uh, group, which we will decide on the basis of staging. For the low-risk group, uh, there is a first-line treatment of skin-directed therapies. For, skin, uh, for intermediate uh, risk group, we also considered skin-directed therapies, UA plus interferon, UA plus Bex routine, and total skin electron beam therapy. For erythrodermic and high-risk groups, we will be needing uh, systemic therapies and radio and chemo. Skin-directed therapies include topical steroid, topical chemo, topical retinoids, phototherapy like FUBA, total skin electron beam therapy, and toll-like receptor like topical imitumor. Systemic therapies. Uh, in systemic therapies, we have op uh, multiple options like immunotherapy, retinoids, few combination therapies, photophoresis, toxin therapy, uh, and toll like receptor antagonists, systemic, few systemic therapy, which we can use in a single agent chemotherapy or combination chemotherapy, and certain targeting tumor antigen and checkpoint molecules. The overall survival of mycosis fungoides is based on its staging. The overall survival of stage 1A at five years is normal. And for stage 1B, 72 to 86 percent. For stage 2B, is 40 to 65 percent. And for stage 4B, it's 0 to 27 percent. The prognosis of hypopigmented MF is much better than for the classical MF. Thank you.
thank you dr faiza and dr nazia asad we uh, we presented two cases a case series of mycosis fungoides as we know that uh, mycosis fungoides is a very uh, mycosis fungoides uh, has many varied uh, presentations uh, and stages of presentation uh, uh, mycosis fungoides may be uh, uh, simple patches and plaques may be phytodermatous mycosis hypopigmented mycosis fungoides and um, ichthyosis form bullus and there are many many ppd like many varieties of mycosis fungoides and it mimics many diseases like in our case second case of hypopigmented mf has as the patient was presented with it was uh, presenting with the hypopigmented lesion he was first treated as leprosy for two years although there were no nerve enlargement and uh, there were there were um, no other features of leprosy but he was treated as hypopigmented uh, with hy leprosy the second differential we have to consider is hypopigmented sarcoidosis and the hypopigmented uh, mf these are important differentials and third if another important differential fourth one is uh, post um, kalaza dermal leishmaniasis which is rare but we have to discuss uh, 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 consider it in any case of uh, in any case of uh, hypopigmented lesions in the body the rest be alba and p verticular and these uh, lesions are easily diagnosable there is not, not cause much difficulty so the second case which the dr faiza presented uh, it was it presented with patches uh, and ulcerated nodules so the staging was different in both cases the first case stage was a 1 uh, b Uh, and in second case the stage was 2b the staging as you know that we uh, do the staging after we diagnose clinically and then confirm it histologically we uh, stage the disease because we uh, uh, by staging we can uh, identify the uh, mode of treatment and also we can uh, identify the prognosis of the patient so uh, when if the patches are less than 1% uh, less than 10% uh, it is 1a and if more than uh, 10% patches and the plaques it is 10b uh, to uh, 1b uh, if there are with any patches and plaques if the uh, there are lymph nodes and one then we take it as 2a and if there are nodules or ulcers then we consider two things uh, either the uh, large cell transformation cd30 positive anaplastic lymphoma and secondly we consider the nodular Uh, or tumoral mf tumoral mf may be dmla that is without any preceding patches and plaque and uh, it may be super added on patches and plaque like uh, in our case there was no cd30 positivity in our case so it was not an aplastic cd positive uh, tumor but it has uh, it had the typical mf pictures in those those nodules and ulcers so uh, the stage of this patient was 2b Uh, fortunately, PET scan was normal in those both these patients. There was no other uh, lymph node involvement or uh, any other blood involvement uh, seen. Uh, so the prognosis jumps from um, like to for two B, it's like ninety percent, and for one uh, B, it is ninety percent five year survival, and in two B, it is just forty percent for five year survival rate. So prognosis depends upon that. So and secondly, uh, we uh, uh, the treatment. for stage 1a uh, 1 uh, 1a 1b and 2a there are skin directed therapies as dr nadia has mentioned there are very various modes of skin uh, topical uh, skin directed therapies and uh, ultraviolet uh, therapies we have previously uh, achieved remission of hypopigmented uh, mf another case with uh, ultraviolet uh, narrow band uvb therapy and uh, but for 2b stage as there are tumors Uh, so we have we'll have to go for systemic for that interferons are good option chemotherapy is good option or tfeb is they are they are good option but they are mainly palliative therapy because the mosses in stage 2b is only 40% by risk survival so in mf the first challenge is to diagnose mf uh, uh, very carefully and to early diagnose mycosis fungoides so that you can treat it at early stage to, uh, to give the patient a better diagnosis so uh, this was the last case of today this is a very rare case hco sarcoma uh, it is initially uh, it usually presents uh, on head and neck mostly on the scalp in old age population and it is very rare tumor 
uh, unfortunately the patient presented late she was had been uh, she was going to uh, various uh, specialists in uh, uh, blochistan but it, she was only prescribed and it was very unfortunate that no one um, took it seriously and only prescribed um, topical corticosteroids and nobody went for uh, uh, biopsy so when she came to us it was already quite advanced with a big swelling on the scalp and uh, huge lymph nodes on cervical uh, region bilaterally and skeletal and pulmonary metastasis so it was high risk uh, stage 4 tumor uh, with very uh, poor prognosis uh, so uh, we counseled the attendants uh, and they took the patient back we, we performed the palliative care she went to koyta uh, it was some uh, uh, after she after some a few uh, one month or so she complained that she is having severe pain in the tumor unfortunately uh, we lost our patient after 9 months 9 months of initial diagnosis and uh, this was it so it was very sad for us uh, so uh, today's session was we presented four cases uh, one was cutaneous cutaneous mucormycosis primary cutaneous mucormycosis second was uh, a cutaneous angiosarcoma and third and fourth cases were the case series of mycosis fungoides one of hypopigmented mf stage 1b and second was the uh, hypo uh, nodular mf and uh, uh, hypopigmented patches in stage 2b uh, so we discussed the prognosis and treatment option for that uh, i hope uh, it, was, it was a useful session for all the consultants and post graduate trainees Uh, for next session, uh, after uh, as this session is going to be held, inshallah, on monthly basis, and host uh, one institute of Karachi will host. First meeting was done by Civil Hospital Karachi, Professor Mera Talat. Second was us by, by us, JPMC. Third mean, uh, meeting of clinical case presentation will be done by Dr. Najia, uh, PNS Shifa Hospital, Karachi. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. any questions you may ask uh, in chat box i have responded to few questions if there are any further questions you may ask uh, later as well uh, so it was asked about the dressing dr shilpa what type of dressing are you doing it was advised by uh, plastic surgery and was guided now the patient can uh, himself do with the help of uh, dresser and there was ye bata diya those monitoring those we monitored the urea creatinine electrolyte for the patient uh, till now the patient is doing fine 1 mg per kg per uh, day uh, dose was given uh, is being given to him and till now we have given 5 grams in total patient had just uh, some raised uh, uh, raised uh, uh, had patient had hypokalemia as a side effect uh, once his creatinine go went up but it is it was controlled by hydrating the patient well uh, so uh, sometimes the patient gets diarrhea and uh, that's all uh, the, the, uh, otherwise the patient is doing fine yes uh, he also developed diabetes uh, his blood sugar also at times uh, went up but now the uh, sugars are okay so i think these are these are all the questions thank you very much and uh, hope to see you uh, next month in the pns shifa hospital presentations